Our next speaker is Raghu uh, Rama, Ramakrishnan. Where is Raghu? Ah, good. Uh, Raghu is the CTO for data and, and, and also a technical fellow in the cloud and enterprise division at Microsoft. Uh, before this uh, uh, appointment, he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. His work in database systems has influenced query optimization in commercial database systems and the design of window functions at SQL 99. He's written the widely used text on uh, database management systems. He received the ACM uh, Innovation Award, the ACM uh, Contributions Award, and the 10-year Test of Time Award. A Distinguished Alum uh, Award from the IIT Madras, and a Packard Foundation Fellowship. Dr. Ramakrishnan received his PhD here in the department in 1987. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be back here. So I have many memories, but we can talk about that afterwards. So today, uh, let me get started because I have a short amount of time here. This is not so much a talk about technology. At the end of the day, I'd like to leave you thinking a little bit about the world of change we are in, and it cuts pretty deep. Okay? Uh, there is a confluence of three kinds of change going on today. First, if you look at it, the amount of data we have access to is growing explosively. Second, the computational resources we need to store this inexpensively and to work with it, it's made incredibly accessible elastic, affordable, thanks to the growing availability of products. Lastly, I use the catchy word intelligence. You've heard a lot about machine learning today, but there's a sea change in how we think about our data and what we can do with it. Historically, we have looked backwards. Payroll, reporting, standard analytics. What was the world like in the past year, past month, past week? Did it go as I thought it would? Increasingly, we are beginning to think about this as a means to predict what is likely to happen, and even more, to intervene intelligently and change that future outcome for one we might like. Okay? So while all this is going on, almost without our realizing it, changes that undercut everyday things like <coughs> laws, privacy, ethics, they are changing without our even thinking about how much they think of the change. Let me start by grounding all of this through some examples. The very first example goes back to my previous job at Yahoo, where when I got there in 2006, pretty much everything you read, every page, was editorially curated. They had an excellent world-class team of editors, but they manually put together every single page view. And one of the things I was asked was, hey, can we personalize the pages we present? And if you're going to personalize, you need to be algorithmic in determining what someone sees. But this then is really a problem of trying to predict what a user is likely to click on. Because ultimately, that's what a website is trying to do, get you to click. To do this, we have a wealth of information. Historically, if you so much as sneeze on a website, we know when you sneeze and for how long. <laughs> and we know this not only about you, but everyone who ever visited that website going back 13 months, which is legally how long we are allowed to hold that data. OK, let's start from there. Using that historical information, I can build a model of which articles are likely to be clicked on. Can I do better? Yes. In the morning, certain articles are more likely to be clicked on. Uh, if you are a man or a woman or someone from Nigeria, odds are I can predict a little more precisely what you're likely to click on. Okay? And oh yes, I do know about you. Uh, especially if you're a logged in user, I know a great deal about you. Okay? So when I put these together, I can do a fairly good job of predicting. But then it doesn't need to stop there. 
the most important point. It's not just historical observation, or observation in the aggregate. When I show you an article, you can either click on it or ignore it. And either way, the outcome is recorded. But then, I can do this in real time. When I have a basket of articles that I'm considering presenting to you, for each of those, I can build distributions of probabilities that say, when shown to a person like this in a context like this, what is the likelihood that they will click? And I can build this by showing you the article, observing whether you click or not, and then using that information, which comes back to me, I can show you, I can display a page in Shanghai. Five minutes later, the results of this little experiment are available to me. So that, that same basket of articles, I can change my probability distribution and decide whether to show the same article to someone similar in sunny day. This notion of a butterfly in Brazil changing the weather in Seattle, yeah, at least it changes the articles you see in Seattle. Right? This is the gist of how articles can be uh, displayed on a web page. Now, there are a couple of lessons I want to take away from this. Uh, side lesson almost. Editorially, the job of a Yahoo editor changed the moment this went live. The click-through rates that we saw, the lifts we saw, depending on the exact location of uh, the page, the lifts were anywhere from 50% to 300%. Uh, over 95% of all page views at Yahoo were based on this approach. Ironically, editors who began by being afraid that this would take away their jobs realized quickly they simply moved further up in the food chain. Deciding upon the pool of articles of interest in the first place, setting constraints to preserve the Yahoo voice. What's voice? I can't define it. But one of the editors told me when I asked them the same question, do you know the difference between the New York Post and the New York Times? I said, yes, that's voice. Okay? How do you preserve the voice of Yahoo as opposed to something else? Uh, these are things humans are good at. But then, by giving them real-time dashboards showing how articles were faring, they were able to do a better job of determining how to program a page, except now they did this by saying, here's the page, here are the pieces of the canvas, here are the underlying candidate articles, and oh yes, throughout the day I'm going to keep changing the underlying candidate pool, but the exact version of the page that you will see at any time is algorithmic. So it changed the job definition. Journalism has been changed fundamentally by the way. The other and more disturbing thing, perhaps, is this. You are being observed. In most ways, the action that follows is benign, as in this case. You have a better browsing experience. But let's keep going. Oh, uh, I didn't want you to keep this <coughs> pattern in mind. Anything you can observe, you can learn from, and you can optimize the underlying process. That's exactly what I illustrated here. But that is a pattern that is being now replicated over and over and over in virtually everything we do. Okay? And that's what I want to get to. Uh, when you look at what made all this possible, I don't really want to go through this in any detail. But the underlying technology, Hadoop, pipelines, NoSQL stores, machine learning, all of this I'm going to lump into this thing I call big data. That's a buzzword. I don't like it any more than most people do. But I'll stick with it because that's the buzzword that's being used for this conflation of technologies. OK. Now, let me come to my current job. I run big data at Microsoft, including our internal services and our external services. Cosmos is Microsoft's internal big data service. And it is staggering in its scope. If you consider Bing, HoloLens, Xbox, Office, doesn't matter. Uh, Bing search rankings are built on Cosmos. When you see ads, the particular ads are determined based on analysis on Cosmos. Right? All of Microsoft, which is a very, very data-driven company, is powered by this environment. And when you look at the scales here, they are staggering. The total amount of data we have is over you know, several exabytes. Let me stop there. Uh, I'm not sure how precise I'm allowed to be. Okay. Uh, the amount of I.O. we do in a given day is in the several hundred petabytes. Okay. Uh, I could go on and on, but 
these numbers are staggering and the point is in five years these numbers will be the norm at many large enterprises okay why do i say that Much of this began, this whole pattern of observing and then optimizing began at the web companies for search, for browsing, for ad uh, placement. And that's because web pages are so easily observed, so easily <coughs> instrumented. But that's not where things stop. Back in 2003, there were more human beings on the planet than the number of things connected to the internet. That changed in 2008. These are predictions from Gartner that by 2020, there will be over 50 billion of these devices. And the amount of data that they'll be exchanging over the, some kind of network will be in the hundreds of exabytes a day. You might ask, how does that connect to me? Well, what, what exactly are these internet thingies? Your refrigerator. Uh, the thermostat in your house, your car, this little device here, the phone in your pocket, every single one of them, your elevator, the plane you probably flew in on, all of its motors, right? Uh, your car, every single one of these things I'm mentioning is probably connected to the internet. What do you do with it? Well, you monitor elevators to determine when to service them. If you can do this proactively, there are great cost efficiencies. It's happening today. This is not science fiction. Uh, same thing for your car. Uh, planes. Your genome. Uh, over the next few years, there's no technical reason why not. It's going to be online. Uh, you may very well carry a chip <coughs> inside you that studies your blood levels and who knows what else. right? And all of this has profound beneficial value. On the other hand, what if an insurance company were to deny insurance based on some analysis of some subset of this data? Okay. These are the kinds of challenges that are around the corner. So let me keep moving. The body of technology that enables all of this Yes, there's the device technology for gathering all kinds of observations. But there's also the overall space of data management, data analytics. Uh, I'm going to put all of traditional databases, machine learning, deep learning, uh, maybe even quantum com uh, computing, given that amazing talk, into this. Right? Ultimately, anything that allows us to gather data and to make sense of it. This is now at a point where we can do things we couldn't even envision just five years ago. And the National Academies uh, are starting to think about how to train people for this. I organized a workshop with John Lafferty. And the key thing here was the traditional silos, databases versus this versus that, no longer apply. The defining characteristic here is it's cross-disciplinary. Whether you are a biologist, or an architect, or a sociologist, you will be illiterate if you don't understand computing, if you don't understand how to gather and use data effectively. Right? Uh, computer science is the new mathematics in this regard. So the late Jim Gray spoke at length about the fourth paradigm. Just like you have a wet lab in every biology department today, very likely you will have a data lab. And very likely, uh, whether it's systems biology or data-driven ecology, uh, already you can see this in astronomy, for example. Data-driven hypothesis will be often a starting point as well as the place where you validate science. Right? Uh, business. We paid $26 billion for LinkedIn, right? Uh, the valuations of companies like Facebook, these are not because of the real estate they own, or even today, frankly, the revenue they earn. 
It's because of the underlying data and the potential of what you can do with it. UPS, you think of it as a company that delivers packages. Now, investors think of it as a company that knows an awful lot about who in, who's moving what type of goods where. Right? The way we think about our world has changed profoundly. It's all data centric. And as this happens, the thing I want to leave you with today is this. Privacy, security, ethics, the legal framework we live under. How should these change given the profound changes in what is known about us and knowable about us? I mean, I say kids. Uh, happily sharing things about themselves on Facebook, and my jaw just drops. Mm -hmm. I realize that I'm old-fashioned. Uh, I realize they're idiots. Mm -hmm. But that's it. Uh, even if you don't overtly put on your Facebook page a bunch of things you'd rather not uh, have out there, just implicitly, you know, if you turn on your GPS on your phone, you can be uniquely identified if everything else is anonymized. And you saw the recent FBI versus Apple thing. That never went to the Supreme Court. We still have a gray area there about who would win. Okay? It was a pity it didn't go to the Supreme Court. I really would like to see more legal clarity on these foundational issues. Because if a ruling there were to say that the phone would have to be unlocked, if you could then take one step further and say that all of these underlying traces can be secured by someone with an appropriate warrant, then exactly what is known about you or knowable about you. Right? Uh, and some of these our legal principles have a lot of gray in them. If you go into a theater and shout, there's a fire, it's actionable. If you stand up in your living room and say there's a fire, it's not. This is on the basis of what constitutes a public risk. But if you sit in your living room and say there's a fire, and you happen to be in an old age home where everything is observed, including what you say, and you know about this, and this gets onto Twitter, and this creates a panic, is this actionable? I mean, I'm making stuff up here now, but you get where I'm going with this, right? There's enough gray in our laws, and the pervasiveness of data and observability and actions stemming from that has now gotten to the point we need to step back and re-examine a lot of things we have taken for granted. Right? And I am bringing this up because, quite frankly, we, the companies, are very focused on making good outcomes monetizable. That's our business. right? But as a larger community, as a university, we have a responsibility, an opportunity to work together with a broader group of constituents and to influence the framework of the laws we live under. And that's not just going to happen organically. So thank you.